Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard. Thank you very, very much. As you know, we've been out for about a month. Uh, there's been a, quite an update, if you will, an upgrade here at uh, uh, PCM, and uh, it's really a blessing. I'm sure you're going to enjoy the the, uh, the the images and the, all that other good stuff that that brings with HD brings with and whatever. So now you can enjoy. So just getting right into the show, what we're going to do at our first first launch off, if you will, is that we're going to take advantage of, a, of an announcement that was just recently done this well this past Saturday, where uh, Governor former Governor Romney. Uh, nominated, identified, uh, selected Paul Ryan, Representative Ryan, as his running mate for the for the presidency or as vice president and whatever. And then, as you know, that means now we've got both. We got President Obama with uh, Vice President Biden, and now we have we have a national race. And I think it's going to be very interesting. And uh, there's been all sorts of things that were said from a national perspective, as far as national media is concerned. But we thought we'd we and I start I'd start off with the show by basically. Uh, sharing with you some of the locals, if you will, uh, as what what do they feel about the uh, the whole idea of the presidential race now that we've got uh, both uh, both presidential hopefuls, if you will, uh, for the next four years coming on board, and uh, we can also take up the advantage of the fact that uh, uh, we're going to try to get some some new new blood, if you will, here at the Oregon Voters Digest. You've you've been very familiar with Bob Williams and I. We've been carrying the ball for quite some time, but also we are very much concerned about the the lack of, of participation among African Americans, being straight up with you, uh, who has a diversity here within the state of Oregon that were very active in the last campaign. And they are, they're here with us today. We got Cameron Whitner, who he ran for mayor, one of the youngest, one of the youngest person, and very respectfully very, very got out there, campaigned across the board, talked to all sorts of people. And I think he did an excellent job. As you know, he, he was here on the show too at one point in time. And then we've got Teresa Redford. She also uh, was very, very, very much involved. She ran for city council. Uh, I mean, background-wise, she was very active and very diverse and was talking about issues across the board, both her and Cameron, both of you. Yes. And I really want to thank you very much for, for having uh, represented the, your respective races in a very respectful way. Did a great job. And uh, the thing that really gets me, Bob, about these two individuals is the fact that it wasn't just running for mayor or running for city council, and then you didn't see them anymore. They've continued, if you will, their activism in their in their respective areas, and uh, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's that's all that's, that's powerful. That's different. That's different. Very yeah, different, very if you will. Different. So we want to make sure we give them the opportunity for to, for you to meet them and know that they're going to be out there. And to add to that, Bob and I have talked a little bit about this piece, and, this, and we're at that point in our life that we want to sort of pass the baton a little bit and get more young folks involved in the process. And so they're going to actually be um, be representatives, if you will, of the Oregon Voters Digest as journalists and uh, reporters or whatever you may want to call them. But they're going to be out there. They're going to be interviewing candidates, both from a national perspective, statewide, local, on various issues and whatever. Then they're going to come on, and they're going to basically take the lead and, uh, and, and do the interview of those respective issues and talk to those issues and whatever. So both Cameron and Teresa, we want to thank you very much. One for accepting that that concept, <laughs> and thank you very much for what you've done in the past and what you're continuing to do. So, so I think with that, let's first introduce uh, let's, let's introduce both Cameron and Teresa. Let's let's introduce you first, Teresa, and sort of kind of in, in your introduction, identify who you are, what are you doing now, and what are, what are, what are some of your involvement at this point in time. We'll do the same thing with you, Cameron. Okay, right. go on. Well, my name is Teresa Rayford, and and. Bruce likes to call me Teresa Radford or Teresa Radford, yep. and so. <laughs> but you, but you. Hopefully, after time, you know, you're the only one that my mom doesn't get mad at about that. But you <laughs> okay. know, um, a lot of what you said is true, and a reason that we're still involved is because we didn't get into the campaign thinking that we could beat people with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that were already currently politicians. But I know that from my standpoint, utilizing the platform of a political arena in a city that has issues that are both economic and historical systematic issues, 
that uh, utilizing that platform to bring light to those issues and to inform the general public was only a necessity that will take us even further. So when the next campaign season comes around, you know, if we continue doing what we're doing right now, I think we'll have better chances. But to stay involved with those issues is a necessity. So general. what are you doing now? Uh, right now, I, I just registered my business, Hazina Management LLC, a consulting firm that deals with management and processes, uh, looking at efficiency and equity, which a lot of those issues came up during the campaign. And it's kind of what we did in Dallas anyway, but um, putting that out there, still doing a lot of actionism. I don't call it activism okay. because we're actually uh, building resolutions as we go along. Yesterday, we held a walk-through sit-in for the lodge over there on Mississippi and Fremont that was vandalized by racist graffiti lately. I uh, just had a national night out uh, last Tuesday, which we had it in Peninsula Park. We partnered with the city and the Piedmont Association, and we were kind of uh, talked about as that being a segregated event, which you know we, we thought that we were gonna bring our community back together, but anyone who was a part of any kind of production or logistics could clearly see that we have issues in our community when it comes to race. Well, race is, uh, you know, one of the things that happened in this, and I don't mean to cut you oh, off, no but is that racism, this is a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. So how do you make money? Racism makes a lot of money. Oh, it does. You know, mm -hmm. being yeah, racist, and being racist in Portland, a lot of people are making money off of that. So what you're trying to do is bring people together. They got to find a way to keep them divided. They good, do. Good point. And, and I had spoke with uh, Daryl Turner, who's the president of the police union. I had him come out and become one of our speakers. And that's where me and him agreed on. We were like, you know, when I went into his office, I said, you know, my great grandfather was a police officer here with the Black Auxiliary Force back in the 50s. And I said, and there's no pictures in your office with those guys. I saw all these historical photos of the police uh, units. And right on his desk, he had a, um, a disc that had the black history of Portland. And he said, it might be on here. And I just got this a couple of days ago. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Was it on but, there? Uh, huh? Was it on there? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm okay. waiting for him to send it to me. But one of the things that we discussed was how our local city council and our mayor and our government there's so much funding coming in because of gang violence, which is usually a racially mixed uh, situation. They say that, I mean, in any, any news brief, if you hear about somebody shooting or hurting somebody, you can count if they're African American, they're going to say this might be gang related. Before they mm -hmm. even know all of the investigation, it's usually going to be gang related because there is money in there and there's money for brown and Latino brothers and sisters that are involved in that. Um, the thing that I wanted to do with the police union was to bring that community closer to the police mm -hmm. so that they don't have to deal with the bureaucracy and all of the funding issues and everything else. We can get on crime prevention. We can become part of the public safety solution mm -hmm. if we are more inclined to deal with each other directly. Um, a lot of people in our community, they won't talk to the police when they know about something that's happened uh, because of those barriers. Those barriers don't take the truth to the court and get them justice. A lot of times it, it increases the crime in their community. But if we have a close relationship with the union and our union president and those officers, we don't have to worry about that information not being used to Good. keep us safe. So. Good point. I like that very much. Please <laughs> welcome Daryl Turner here on the Oregon Voters' Digest. I had him and, and Joanne please. Hardesty both, both on the same stage. Well, I'll tell you what, get, so <laughs> get them on here, up. get them on here. We've been, Bob and I have been trying to do that piece, but yeah, if, you can, get that, if oh. you can get that done, you know, please, let's no, get that done. I had done. them there. We got okay. it on video. Right, we good. have Joanne good. and uh, Daryl, so okay, it's good. good. All right, Cameron, <laughs> talk about it. How's it going? Oh, fine, buddy. You did a great job, by the way. I, I thought that was, that was excellent. Thank you. I mean, really. It took a lot out of me. I mean, in all due respect, <laughs> I, I mean, in all due respect, someone representing the homeless who happened to be an African American, mm -hmm. that was a, that was historical in itself. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, in addition to the fact that you were ran, the, the way you ran for mayor, too. Yeah. So what's going on? Well, I'm 21 years old. I've been in Portland for the past three years. I'm an activist. I've been involved in over a dozen nonprofits, and I ran for mayor. I just got done with a 55-day hunger strike. I was doing that. Uh, started on June 2nd, ended about two weeks ago, lost 35 pounds. I've gained Look about good. 22 pounds back so far, so it's coming back fast. <laughs> so you're eating well, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eating a lot of food. Yeah. I don't like having to wear s size small shirts. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. kind of different for me. So what are we doing now? What are you doing now, active-wise? Uh, I'm spread a little thin. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, there's everything. You know, I've been in school since June 25th, and finals yeah. are coming up soon, so I'm working on that. And also working on you know continuing our housing agenda, really bringing uh, 
coalition together with faith communities and nonprofits really trying to prepare for this mm -hmm. uh, regional summit the city has proposed and also trying to work on further negotiations about uh, you know emergency camping a housing levy and you know uh, foreclosure resistance and so yeah. we're trying to work with the city on that I'm also working on environmental issues you know one of my big ones is the Hayden Island project uh, they're showing a lot of reports you know questioning whether uh, building new terminals is going to uh, give us more capacity for trade yeah. because we yeah. still have plenty of open terminals still mm -hmm. yeah. and so definitely trying to make sure that uh, the voice of the community is here and is a democratic process and I definitely am still preparing to you know have my endorsement for the you know general election with the mayoral campaigns and then I already endorsed Amanda Fritz for the city commissioner position. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the main uh, position that I'm really trying to propose is the Charter Review Commission, something that was very important to me during the mayoral campaign, really trying to see how we can increase the efficiency of uh, community activism and bringing democracy to its strongest point within our local government. Good point. Yeah, I like that. I like your, your background and whatever, and, and as far as other involvement. And again, you, in fact, the second half hour we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about West Hayden Island, and I've got two guests coming on, and we're just going to. The whole idea is to try to educate the public about the significance of that of that area of within this right within the city. But for mm -hmm. some strange reason, it's not talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are not that familiar. We live with. too close to the other side of the river. Is that what? <laughs> is that what <laughs> okay. We're going to get, we're get involved in that. But so, can I ask? Go, Cameron, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Cameron, uh, you know, in your in your quest for housing and dealing with housing and, and uh, all of that. Have you looked at how is it, what is the, uh, I'm trying to think of how to word this, but what is the outlook for housing for uh, those uh, that are with, that are the, the called a transit or low income housing in the city of Portland? Does that exist now? There, uh, there is some transient housing, as you would say. Uh, their last uh, pilot project you would say would be the Bud Clark Commons where they spent about 52 uh, million dollars and they have 130 beds they ha they have for people it's a wet house meaning that you don't mm. have to be sober to enter that mm. and they have a 90 uh, bed space for uh, men uh, the last affordable house for how bed long how long can you stay there <laughs> see and that's I think the important it's in, part I think it's indefinite indefinite it might be that or two years actually okay. I'm not sure about that detail okay. um, the last thing they built recently was a Gray's Landing that's in the south waterfront that's the first affordable housing complex there, mm -hmm. but they only reserved uh, 44 spaces for veterans. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like they are, you know, chipping away at the issue, but at the same time, economically, uh, the need for affordable housing for everyone mm -hmm. is building. And so we're seeing, you know, the population of homeless, that demographic is definitely shifting. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being, you know, repeated transients, we're really seeing a lot of uh, single families and a lot of youth and a lot right. of other people who, you know, are just in an economic, you know, um, they're, mm -hmm. they're suffering from the recession, mm -hmm. and right now we do not have the housing that's required to help people considering the foreclosure rate that's going on. Are they required so, to pay a small fee of some sort? The homeless. The homeless? Yeah. Uh, not if they're on the streets, no. Okay, so they don't have to pay a fair fee. No. Okay. And on your foreclosure, look, you know, something that has always bothered me in this foreclosure deal is that if you have a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan, which is a government backed loan, then the government will come in and help you, you know, with uh, refinancing and, and everything. But if you have a, a regular loan, you SOL. Yeah. You know, you're out there on your own. And with your with the housing market in a downturn or, or have flipped over and where you had equity, you now are underwater and you can't refinance. Do you see any anything in what you're doing addressing that issue? Well, I try to bring it up um, without having so much dialogue about the political issue. That's why I was trying to bring uh, Multnomah County into it, mm -hmm. you know, because the sheriff currently, he has the ability to, you know, enforce evictions and whatnot. But I definitely do believe it's a huge issue. I believe it was in Springfield, Illinois, where their city council, they tried to pass a foreclosure bill mm -hmm. that made um, banks go into a mortgage counseling program before right. they foreclose on somebody. And the banks are actually right now in the courts trying to sue over that. And so there is an issue where we have banks that aren't regulated to ensure that the prosperity of people are actually, you know, a variable when they decide to foreclose on somebody. And I wanted to say a thing about what you were talking about as far as the Fannie Mae and the Fannie Max. Uh, a lot of the banks, when you're looking and you're doing an audit from an accounting standpoint, 
you're looking at somebody that was actually signing all of their documents, getting all of their lending through Fannie Mae, and at closing at the title company, signed documents that say Wells Fargo or Bank of America. Mm -hmm. So they were getting backed by those loans to get approved, but at closing, they were signing documents and getting checks, I mean, getting invoices from different banks that they hadn't even went to for the lending. And so some of those banks that, you know, now are trying to fight these new foreclosure laws, they had premeditated that this was going to happen, and some of them were smart enough to do and be proactive so that they wouldn't have to worry about that. Right. And so there's going to have to be a lot more investigation where that goes mm -hmm. from. But I know that Wells Fargo is one of the biggest ones that created that type of, you know, right. asset value when they were trying well, to get that money. One thing that you're going to see is that I used to be a loan officer. Me too. And <laughs> one of the things that you're going to see is that those seven and ten year loans are now beginning to come due. Those mm -hmm. uh, interest only and uh, adjustable rate mortgages. Mm -hmm. And when they begin to come due and adjust, you're going to see this start again where people can't afford it and they're mm -hmm. going to walk away mm -hmm. because the economy hasn't, uh, you know, their economy hasn't gone up, meaning their paycheck or their income. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to end up seeing them begin to walk away, and then we want to see what happened mm -hmm. out there. You know, Bob, you make a good point because that's going to be another issue that we want to you, want to address. Maybe that'll be one of your tasks: okay. as reverse mortgage. Yeah, you got a new <laughs> program on the table at this point in time, and you know, a lot of times there's a little confusion in terms of understanding what that means quite a bit. Right. So we are going to have a, an interview, if you will, on that legal line with your background or whatever. I think it would be real good. That we'll do that piece. Okay. Well, as you can see, we're going to have some very exciting folks that are going to be getting out there, both between Teresa. 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 Boy, I tell you, I, I just, I just get, get but anyway, we, we, you understand, T. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. That's your T name for me on T C. I know T.C. Mm -hmm. T.C.? I got no. T. I got T in the camera, see? Yeah. Oh, wow. you see but, <laughs> yes. but anyway, no, it's going to be welcome aboard, and um, I'm sure you guys are going to do a good job. And, and again, the, the whole purpose of our show, as you know, is to educate and inform. Right. That's a very, very important piece, and I think that's going to be very important. And this gives you a vehicle, if you will, to take take another st segment and educate the rest of the people when they see you out there knowing what you're trying to do is for the betterment of our society, our livability, the whole nine yards. So thank you very much for accepting the fact that you'll serve in that capacity. Absolutely. And we'll talk about the schedule. Mm -hmm. And on that same note, um, in fact, next week, it seems that old Fred, Fred's going to be putting together a debate between uh, uh, former Commissioner Charlie Hill. A and conversation. Oh, yeah, right. We're going to make a conversation. conversation between Charlie Hill this? and <laughs> Jefferson Smith. So Representative Jefferson Smith. So that's going to be a kind of interesting mm -hmm. piece. And then hopefully maybe following that, uh, we can kind of, between the, between the two of you, whatever, you maybe come up with something in regards to the following week so we can get right down to the meat of the matter, okay? Because <laughs> right we, we do have an election that's not that mm -hmm. far around. Absolutely. 86 so, days before the election, and uh, how do we get people involved? I mean, right now it looks like uh, they're, everyone's watching TV, mm -hmm. and they're watching whichever channel best suit them, either Fox or CNN. Mm -hmm. And they're getting one side here, one side there, but no one is getting, uh, is really and truly researching to find out what the meat and potatoes is exactly. and the issues. But that's what we are. Uh, and that's, that's why that's we're we here, yes. and that's why we're going to discuss that's this in the do. next half an hour. I tell you what, we got, a next, uh, we got about another 15 minutes, maybe at the most, maybe 20, 10 minutes or so. Let's, let's throw on this whole issue about the presidential race. I mean, <laughs> like I said, I think that's a heavy piece. I like to just go around the table and just kind of get a sense of what do you feel about the fact that uh, we got the presidential race now, and, and however you want to respond to that, just go on and respond accordingly, okay? Bob, I'll start with you. What do you oh, think? Well, you're gonna make, okay, I'll I mean, set not? the groundwork. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'm kind of smiling. Think about at the, five minutes. Okay, I'm about. I'm smiling at the fact that Paul Ryan is the uh, is the vice presidential candidate uh, uh, has, has been selected to be the vice vice presidential uh, candidate to run with Mitt Romney because they want to paint him as a golden boy with the, with these great ideas. And the truth of the matter. Well, make sure you clarify. You are a Democrat. I am a Democrat. Okay, all right. I all served right. as uh, chair of the Black Caucus of the Democratic Party. I mean, uh, I mean not that you're not partial to Paul. No. I know you're partial I mean, to Paul. You like well, Paul. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you and tell you that I've always voted for whom I thought was the best. Right, okay. And uh, we had uh, senators here uh, that I voted for who were not Democrats. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, I, I believe that if you do the job, you should get my vote. But I look at, I'm looking at what these guys are doing. 
and what and how people are lambasting the president over trying to do good for people. You know, uh, this country, everybody's saying that you need to, you know, you need to carry your own weight. Well, some people can't carry their own weight. We have to help them until they are able to stand on their own. I'm not saying for life. I'm saying until they can stand on their own. And somehow or another, we've gotten away from that. So which and camp do you think is, is, is pro for it or not? Uh, well, I think the Democrats are trying, are still trying to help people, okay. and okay. Republicans are trying to help business. And they, but the the difference in helping business is they're not trying to help small business; mm -hmm. they're trying to help big business. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when when George Bush passed the stimulus package, had his had the stimulus package passed when he was there, it wasn't to help small people. It was to help big business because he understood that if those if those businesses went under, then all the people were going to be hurt, and it was going to hurt other business. So he understood that. But when he left, when he got his pass, and he didn't get enough, he got what he could. And President Obama had to come in and ask for more, you know, because he saw that hey, some of the major corporations around the country and across the world was about to go under. And that's a domino effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, got, so, we got to cut them off. Let's, yeah. go, let's get around. I here. didn't get my five minutes. Uh, that's but I, know. <laughs> I, I noticed they just hit yeah. me. Yeah. It was about 20 minutes. Okay, we got about 10 minutes. Now we got 10. All right, give me about two minutes. Uh, Talk right, to about me. About two minutes? Yeah, Cameron. Okay. Well, I was a little disappointed that Romney didn't choose Marco Rubio. Okay. That would make the Republican Party admit that there's some diversity and they're not racist. Okay. So they can still be in a white man's club right now. Um, you know, I'm concerned mostly when I think of this election about our world economy. We've already seen how Romney, he's got absolutely nothing in terms of, you know, uh, foreign relations. He has no skill set <laughs> whatsoever there. And I'm concerned coupled with mix. Paul Ryan's austerity <laughs> budgets. We've seen what happened in Greece and whatnot. Austerity is not going to lead to, you know, social harmony. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm definitely going to see if they were to get elected, we could see how it would affect both here domestically, here in foreign, you know, how badly America might, you know, surge when economically with, you know, you know, horrible customer service <laughs> and then just not giving anything out. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be a pretty equation. Other than that, you know, he came from Wisconsin. I hope they, they're probably thinking that they'll get support in that swing state. But, you know, when he got elected, he only had 52% of the vote. So it's not really going to help them winning over that swing state right there. Okay. And it definitely seems like a really safe bet that helps him with conservatives. But still, he still has to please the independents. And right now, he's got nothing to show. He is a flip-flopper. Uh, he's an action sketch. And uh, I have extreme doubts that he's going to be our next president. Hey, it's coming from Cameron. I was going to say, I thought it was a joke. I thought maybe I was joking and it didn't really happen that way. Was that a good but thing for no. him in terms of selection or not? No, it was, I mean, he, he selected his clone. He didn't select anybody that was any different as far as his ethics and values. Who should he, he have is. selected, you think? Um, I think he should have just dropped out of the race. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a waste of money and time. To have He's this got guy it. Even running. He has plenty of it, but I'm thinking um, if if he had any sensible people that were financing his campaign that maybe they'll use their good sense to take a step back because of this selection that he's made. And I've even heard from people that were former Navy and military people that were kind of um, annoyed at the fact that they did a press conference on top of the Wisconsin, the SF, mm -hmm. you know, the USS Wisconsin there um, that's docked in Wisconsin. They were offended by that because neither of these men have served our country in the form of a military branch. Never been a military. And so they, you know, they're standing there and I said, well then, you know, whoever is doing the marketing for this campaign is already off to a rocky start because some of the comments that were made was why didn't they stand in front of business or in front of people that are looking for a better economic opportunity or in front of schools because our schools are failing why would they stand on top of the ship when that's been our biggest issue over the last what 12 years right. and so um, it just shows the disconnection that they have and I guess he picked him because you know maybe he would be appealing to the women voters but I'm the state director of <laughs> UniteWomen.org here in Oregon. And I can tell you right now that with the ethics and the morals and some of the decisions that they have both made, it's taking women a step back another 50 years. And so I know that women like myself and women within the organization, we don't endorse candidates, but he doesn't stand for anything that women see as value. So. One, one of the main, one of the things that they talked about quite a bit was uh, his his position as far as uh, Medicare, uh, yeah, and Medicare and things of that nature, and I.E. vouchers and things of like that for seniors and mm -hmm. possibly costing them more and things of that nature. 
Well, what, what impact do you think that would have? Well, it's, it's kind of, it, that's kind of uh, strange because they have two separate, two different ideas about Medicare. Uh, and, and, you know, at one time, uh, uh, Ryan and, uh, and, our, and our Senator uh, Wyden came together to put together a proposal uh, because everyone was against what the president was doing, they tried to put something. Why didn't it happen, together. Barbara? You, since you brought yeah, that up, right. a Democrat went with. Uh, <laughs> well, with that's Republican. called crossing the aisle. Crossing the aisle, <laughs> and so they put they put something together, and of course it was uh, it was uh, wasn't accepted by the Republican led Congress, uh, and so Ryan went off and did his own thing, and since the Senate is control was controlled by. Uh, Republicans, they passed. They passed. I'm sorry. Democrats, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, the uh, house. Uh, the house was house controlled was right. by Republicans. Right. They passed it, and of course, uh, the Senate didn't. Did pass it. And so, you know, but that wasn't what Ron and he had talked about. But where where is Senator Ron White? Since you brought that issue up, I mean, this? has he denounced it? I mean, I've not. Yeah, he I'm has. Not he wrote twenty. He wrote a paper uh, on on what happened there. A twenty three hundred word paper uh, explaining him. And Ryan versus what Ryan went off and but did by but himself. But they're still using his name. In fact, they well, did it on Meet the Press. They welcome, did it on CNN and said, "Hey, look here, welcome to Ron politics." Wyden is still, <laughs> Ron Wyden is is with us Republicans. Bruce, on this if issue. you if you hit a cat back in 1965, <laughs> and you want to ask someone, ask ask Packwood. Twenty years later, it'll come back to get you. That's yeah. right. You know, so because right. you do yeah. something in a positive oh, yeah. vein with someone, and they change their view means that, hey, you were his buddy. You know, that's like saying well, that. Well, maybe we might be able to get Senator Wyden to come on and, and, and just share. That'll share be, with that'll the, with be the my public. project? Yes, sir. I knew it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. That's, that's a good point. But no, in all due respect, we need to talk about this because yes. there are many seniors out there. You know, we talk about the baby boomers, if you will, and these folks have retired. You know, they're living on limited income, many of them, whatever. And it, to, to, it's a lot of, like a shock, yeah. mm -hmm. like a shock, you know, in this whole peace aspect of it. So, and if you're between 54 and 65, you better be watching this yes, election right. because right. the Republicans got something in their pocket for you, and it's gonna and they're gonna bring back some things. You know, someone told me say conservatism is a is a is something that continues to return. They don't, you know, they they keep think you should live in the past, mm -hmm. and so if you want to live in the past, they're going to bring back 25% of your Social Security being given off, and one, that's another subject we need to we talk about. We want to talk about, right. Well, look, folks, we, we've, we've got another, I've got another segment that we've got to do, and want to thank all of you for being here with us. Looking forward to the future, those future shows, Camera, Teresa, mm -hmm. all right? And, uh, and Bob, I mean, really, going to be, it's, it's going to be exciting. These are exciting times. Uh, we all going to have to put your pitch in, regardless of whether you're a Republican or Democrat or whatever, independent, libertarian, whatever. We're going to have to work together yes. to get this economy going again. Yes. So with that, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back with our next guest. Thanks again, folks. Thank you. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Okay, folks, look like we're back on at this point in time. And as I indicated before, you, you see the photo here? We're talking about Hayden Island. A lot of you probably remember, you probably shopped down there, maybe at Safeway or something like that, or back in the old days, you know, there was a the big pool and the carousels and all kinds of things. And, you know, it's like, a, it's like a hidden oasis, if you will. I mean, there's residential folks that are there. There are businesses out there. I mean, it's a really a fun kind of a situation. But for some strange reason, there's, a major, there's an entity, outside entity, that wants change. They're a major change aspect there, but I've got some individuals that are on at this point in time to educate you about uh, what what directions, if you will, there are some elements outside of this community that wants change. So with that, you got you get the photo there. Yep. Okay, good. All right then. All right, here my here the, here my guest here at this point in time. I, I know both of these guys. I just so happen I happen to be a resident on the island myself. Oh. <laughs> and then you Bob used to. Interest, how about yeah. that? Well, hey, Bob was at Safeway. He was right. at one point yeah. in time. He was managing the Safeway store out there. Good right. aspect cool. of it. Very effective. So anyway, uh, I've got I've got Tim uh, Tim Timmy Timmy Helson. Tim 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 T I M M E. I know. All right, all right, okay. Timmy. Confuses people all the time. Tim Tim Helser, <laughs> and uh, naturally I've got my my dear friend Herman Cachel. Right, that right? Yeah, that's good. And that, that yeah. new, you know, I'll give you extra points. Good. You did good. Hayden Island Livability Project in Kansas with friends of West Hayden Island. Exactly. And that's what we're gonna we're gonna focus, if you will, on the West Hayden Island. We're gonna start off right off the bat with you, Tim. What does that mean? What is, what is West Hayden Island? Why don't you educate the folks right there? Where is West Hayden Island? Well, you want to put the, you put the film? The you want, you want to put this back on? Sure, that'd be fine. Okay, and I'll point to it. As you're yeah, driving, Bob. as you're driving across the interstate bridge, mm -hmm. you're really on the eastern third of the island there's a railroad bridge that divides the island east from west just about right in the middle it's mm -hmm. the santa fe it's uh, right there. This is burlington right here, yeah. northern okay i'm pointing at it right uh, now rail railway okay e west of that rail railway it, about 825 acres okay. of urban natural wildlife habitat. Wow. Okay. It is basically undeveloped. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit of it development okay, on we it. Just but keep basically talking. it is a wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, the port at this point sees it as a marine reserve and they think that it would be an ideal place to build uh, a terminal uh, and a deep water terminal and put on uh, circumferential railway so that they can use it to offload cars or containers or grain or what they call break bulk mm -hmm. um, and basically use that that island uh, piece as a new terminal we don't think that there's a demand for that uh, we think that it's a much more valuable piece of property to keep as it is and to restore as a natural wildlife habitat than anything that uh, the port has. Now they own property. that. Who owns that piece they of property? They own it. They, they own, own it. The, the now, port of Portland. Port of Portland owns is an entity of the state. Okay. They have some uh, leeway to make decisions on their own, but they have uh, three objectives. One, to manage port facilities, mm -hmm. airports, uh, port terminals, and that sort of thing. Number two, to generate revenue for the general fund. And number three, to manage the environment. Mm -hmm. Those are their three jobs. In this case, we don't think that they're going to be generating any revenue mm -hmm. because the port is unneeded and they're certainly going to destroy a whole lot of urban wildlife habitat. Okay. And the definition of the port, if we were just to, if I were to ask you, what is the definition of the port of the port, port, of, port of Vancouver port of Terminal? Yeah, what well, is the port, port of Portland? Portland is a government base? entity that manages uh, port facilities, okay. whether it be marine port or airport or uh, other okay. properties that it has. Uh, and, and part of it is industrial, part of it is transportation, part of it is manufacturing, part of it's retail. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's and they may jump in just sure. and they extends beyond just the city of Portland. Okay. I mean, because they're the Hillsborough Airport, mm -hmm. this port of Portland property too. Mm -hmm. They own that. They bought it from some years back. So you know, they're they're it's kind of a misnomer in a way. To say the port of Portland is kind of a more of a port of this mm -hmm. whole tri-county area almost because mm -hmm. it, it's far reaching, and uh, and maybe it'd be a good chance to right now to talk about. 
you know, where we got, how we got here to this point. Yeah. Because how'd you guys get involved? The, well, the city commissioners um, decided, and Sam Adams signed an agreement with the Port of Portland. Okay. To uh, look at developing 300 acres, approximately, of West Hayden Island, and preserving the 500 acres as natural habitat. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, commissioned the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to make it look, see what the feasibility. Mm -hmm. of doing that is 300 acres big enough for an industrial development mm -hmm. and of course we feel it's not uh, it's, it's not needed and it's just you know a bad idea and I think it's more important that the whole thing be preserved either as a nature park which we'll get into later right. or just left alone because they're going to need mitigation for the Superfund sites on the, on the Willamette mm -hmm. possibly they need additional mitigation for the dams on the Columbia mm -hmm. and if they lock this up with an industrial area they're going to have to find mitigation for that mm -hmm. so they have to look to other areas mm -hmm. I think the best overall idea is to leave it alone mm -hmm. and they're kind of behind really now because the Port of Vancouver already has a rail loop built where all that has to be done is connected to the main line mm -hmm. and they don't have any anybody any businesses interested yet so and and this this project is kind of you know they're laying the groundwork now, but it's going to be off in twenty twenty five to twenty thirty five before actually any business would actually would they start developing it and turning it into a, a job creator, mm -hmm. and uh, we're looking in the short term if the Columbia River crossing gets done we're going to be losing yeah. huge numbers mm -hmm. of jobs and businesses because mm -hmm. of that. So. You know, whenever I start thinking about the Port of Portland, I think about ships coming in from the you know exactly, right. ships coming in, unloading their products, mm -hmm. and then basically putting them on trucks and taking them out to various mm -hmm. destinations. Mm -hmm. You got me. And so, what are they? What are you saying? Uh, their, their, their plan maybe is to put a bridge across there, and maybe uh, they, they'll now unload ships there on that corner. It doesn't make sense. Well, it? from the Port of Portland's perspective. Okay. This location is ideal for traffic because it's close to a major train track. It has it can accommodate barge traffic. It certainly can accommodate rail and highway traffic. It can also accommodate with a little bit deeper uh, channel. It can it can accommodate uh, ocean-going ships. Mm -hmm. Most ports maybe have shipping lane and rail. We have four. Uh, ways of moving things in and out of here. The fact of the matter is, regardless of how uh, attractive this may look from an industrial development point of view, experts have been hired to study whether there is a demand to develop something like this, and these outside experts who are economists and environmental experts uh, have looked at it over the long term, and they say, this may barely pencil out. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars over the next 20 years to develop this thing and to ruin all of these acres of natural wildlife, it better pay off big time. Mm -hmm. It is barely going to pay off if it pays off at all. The other thing that they claim, that the port claims, is this will generate family wage jobs. Well, these same experts, Eco Northwest, has studied that question very carefully, and they say maybe there will be a few jobs created over the next 25 years, mm -hmm. but not very many. What about all this industrial transportation? Let's say if, if they were developed, if you will, where would all those trucks and things of like that go along? I mean, is, is, well, is there currently, a community? currently the I, their plan is to use Nor uh, Hayden Island Drive. Which is our little two-lane road along the yeah, going east and west on the <laughs> island. Not that much this is going to turn. They're going to turn this into a truck route. This is the kind of the plan. Although we pressured them enough that they to keep the bridge that would go from West Hayden Island over to Marine Drive on the table at least. Don't just throw it away because that mm -hmm. was their intention to throw yeah. that out. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to push for that. But that, I mean, in the in the holidays. <laughs> season mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, Hayden Island Drive is a parking lot I mean you just don't go anywhere that's right that's right you know it's amazing Jensen so, Beach so, is such a popular place that a lot of people yeah, right. exactly. shop there, there particularly from have Vancouver a, yeah. they're building cool. a brand new Target and it's right there exactly and, 
have anyone looked at the pollution that this will cause for the uh, for people living in the uh, in the North Portland area or the North uh, uh, or the Van West Side, uh, the, yeah, the the West Vancouver? Side. That's what they're doing. Uh, now. Mm-hmm. But not only that, I know at the one time we had a young lady on who was talking about building instead of doing the I five bridge, there was a possibility of building a bridge back on that side that would uh, carry traffic and eliminate traffic coming through the neighborhoods, right. both in Vancouver and in North Portland going to the terminals. Mm-hmm. So the question then becomes, once they start developing this land, what will it do to the, uh, to the, to the width and, uh, of, the, uh, of the river? What type of, uh, you know, because it's recreational yeah. uh, down in there as well, am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. what will it do to the people that, that use it for boating, for fishing, for, for all the other things? Right. I mean, they, it's so much that they're thinking about just business in the future, right. maybe, that well, they're, they're not trying to develop. The city uh, uh, has been looking at how this may work over about the last five years. And within the last six months, the uh, Portland Planning Commission has said, we really want to look at what health impact this development will have on human beings mm-hmm. in this area. So they have uh, expected uh, the Port of Portland uh, and the City of Portland to develop what's called a health impact assessment. Mm. Uh, what's the likely impact that this development will have on the health of people nearby? Um, Herman is well aware of a, a health impact assessment that was done in Oakland mm. in a very, very similar uh, situation and they found overwhelmingly the the increase in uh, cancer yeah. particularly lung cancer from the uh, diesel particulates mm-hmm. and all of the other fumes mm-hmm. and they've also shown that people who live close to these developments live significantly shorter lives mm-hmm. so we we want to see that uh, health impact assessment done uh, in the next uh, couple of months to make sure that we understand what the impact is. But right. we expect that it's not going to be very pretty. You know, it sort of reminds me of being in, being in Norman, whatever, the Agent Orange concept. You know yes. what I mean? You, you know, you spray all the foliage, if you will, and all of a yeah. sudden it just gets in your lung. And then, oh, yeah. in fact, many vets today, and they're changing the rules and saying if you spent two days or more in Nam, you, you, you're actually, you're part and part. People are i.e. Oh. cancer and all kinds of stuff. So you're right, all those fumes and this, that, and the other. And we, we're probably catching some now, well, I'm sure just where they are located. Well, here's what's going on, on currently. <laughs> we have yep. a north-south uh, railroad track mm-hmm. that's very close to the uh, uh, manufactured home community mm-hmm. within uh, half a block. We also have the I-5 corridor, okay? So those are two major uh, uh, polluting uh, avenues. Then we have ships that are docked over here at right. Terminal 6, mm-hmm. right. and mm-hmm. the port claims that they can't afford to plug these ships into some kind of an electrical outlet, so they let these um, uh, diesel engines uh, run. idle wow. night and day, wow. which pumps a lot of pollution in. Well, if you add an even larger port mm-hmm. on right on the Columbia, right here at the West Hayden <laughs> Island, you're adding a whole lot more pollution. Mm. Plus, the traffic studies have shown that if you do build this project, once it's built, there will be an additional 516 diesel trucks every 24-hour period, every day, uh, in addition to 1,500 extra car travel trips a day. So you've got about 2,000 more trips per day going in and out of this port facility than you have now. So the you asked earlier about mm-hmm. uh, air and water pollution <laughs> as well as land pollution. It's going to go up significantly. Oh, yeah. You know, the point you make, again, thinking about the tourism we have in that area, there's a lot of tourism in that area, plus fishermen. Mm-hmm. In fact, I noticed there was an article in Oregonian today that said that uh, Governor Kitzhopper was looking at stopping the the netters, the if gill you will, netting. the gill netting, mm-hmm. if you will, so.
i.e. we could take advantage, if you will, of sports fishing all along the Columbia Corridor, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that's a very popular fishing area mm -hmm. uh, on the, near the island and right there on the island because yes, the fish is. court, I mean, you see long lines of boats there, people are fishing for salmon and this, that. That's quite a revenue, if you oh, will. Well, if you, a lot of jobs. Well, if, you look at the, if you look at the life uh, cycle of salmon uh, as their little fingerlings, right. they only swim a very short distance before they have to stop and rest. Well, all along mm -hmm. uh, West Hayden Island mm -hmm. is a great stopping place mm -hmm. for these juvenile salmon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are the most susceptible to uh, being affected by pollutants in the water, mm -hmm. uh, temperature, uh, particulates, uh, other chemicals that they're certainly not used to. If we're concerned about our, our salmon runs, mm -hmm we have to take a look at what is affecting those fingerlings as they're swimming Back up and in, down the, right. the Columbia. Well, the other side of this is, I know when we were looking at building uh, the bridge across the Willamette for, uh, for transit when I was mm -hmm. on the TriMet board, uh, and all the things that came into it is the bridge, uh, when, you, when you build a bridge and the footing for the bridge is in the water, it changes the temperature yes, of does. that water. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna end up with more ships in here and more idling ships, mm -hmm. not only do you get more pollution, but you heat the water more. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things come into play. And if you don't know the question to ask, you know, you're gonna you're gonna you are you are not gonna you're gonna end up with the with the answer mm -hmm. uh, just basically mm -hmm. that doesn't it's, give you any It's a great point in that in that if you have idling ships here, yes. they also cast a shadow those shadowed areas mm -hmm. are where predators like to come in yes. and hide eat up and all the small salmon. Eat up yeah. all the small salmon. Wow. So it's a, wow. it gets to be a really complicated oh, yes. problem. You know, another point that I might throw out, you know, we got the zoo here that, that tends to attract a lot of the kids. But again, from the standpoint of access to the water for folks in southeast Portland, in the northeast Portland, things like that, you know, as far as kids going to the island, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, the plan, i.e., of making sure that we got bald eagles up in that area, sure. we got deer, we got, we got all kinds of animals. If you, I mean, it would be a beautiful place, if you will, to actually to build on such. Well, Herm mm -hmm. lives just within blocks of this area. He yeah. can tell you all yeah, kinds love, of. My wife and I live in the manufactured home community. We're closer to the Thunder, the old closed Thunderbird Hotel, mm -hmm. but it's still very close. Um, you know, talking about the fish you know, in the CRC project with the footings for that new bridge, they can only do them in certain times of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because they, they got to wait for the fish runs mm -hmm. to go through before they can start going at it again. They have a limited amount of time they can do things. That was one of the uh, things that were was brought up because of all the footings. You know, mm -hmm. if you could build a bridge with less footings, right, you could right. build it faster. Right, exactly. Right. And uh, the same sort of thing would apply here, this industrial development and the docks that would have to be built and on and on and on. It's, you know, it's just... Um, uh, Our it's government just uh, service agency, Metro, mm -hmm. has made a, a long-term study of West Hayden Island and um, along with a lot of other biologists and botanists, they have uh, determined that there are about 81 different species of birds, yes. nine different species of mammals, mm -hmm. uh, four different species of reptiles, nine different species of uh, butterflies and moths, uh, as well as some major stands of uh, uh, ash and um, cottonwood. So mm -hmm. One of the biggest stands of cottonwood uh, between the coast and uh, Bonneville wow. Dam. All of that will be significantly threatened. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, so when you're talking about uh, park access, mm -hmm. uh, Metro in their goal five, uh, nature in the neighborhoods, uh, said one of our goals is to make sure that people have access to parks. This 825 acres would make an absolutely mm -hmm. stunning mm -hmm. nature preserve and nature study park. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an organization called Trust for Public Lands. Mm -hmm. It's nationwide. Uh, it gathers up money, buys property, creates parks uh, in uh, nearby metropolitan areas. They have over the last 20 years studied the economic and health benefits and costs of having parks nearer major population areas mm -hmm. 
And what they're finding over this 20 year study is that residential values near those parks, residential values mm -hmm. go up. Um, commercial and retail businesses improve where there's a park nearby. Uh, regional tourism goes up. Uh, recreation use obviously mm -hmm. uh, increases. Natural wildlife habitat improves because it's protected. Uh, human health begins to thrive at a higher level. Community cohesion mm -hmm. begins to grow because there are volunteer projects mm -hmm. that local people mm -hmm. can get involved in uh, with a local park. Water quality, air quality, mm -hmm. all of those improve. Mm -hmm general quality of life improves mm -hmm. when there uh, is a major park mm -hmm. nearby. Mm -hmm. You can reverse all that by putting in a, an industrial development complex and property values will go down, mm -hmm. health will go down, tourism mm -hmm. will go down, mm -hmm. water and air quality will go down. Um, all of that just gets reversed. Mm -hmm. You know, and that same, on that same note, you know, there's a development now in, in actually on the island with reference to the, the, the mall aspect yeah. of it. And one of the main attractions was the carousel. Right. Sure. Right. And it drew a lot of kids, you know, from all over because they'd never had access. Right. And it was right there. And there's, there's still a question as to whether or not we're going to be able to maintain it. Yeah, it's all and stored away right now, but we away. don't know for you sure if it's coming and back. Here's an opportunity to put, make it sort of an inclusion. Exactly. Walking path, carousel, sure. the whole nine yard. Just, just, just think Central. of this. If they were to build a circular track high off the ground because of all the different mm -hmm. uh, species that mm -hmm. are in there, mm -hmm. uh, just build it off and it's circular. And you can you can ride that, and it's slow. It takes 10, 15 minutes to ride through, you know. And you can look down and see all the different things. Just imagine uh, the the attraction that would have mm -hmm. versus a terminal that's going to bring uh, sickness and illness to yeah. the residents in the area. I, I agree. Mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's just so many other things you can do with this. Back thing. in 1979, mm -hmm. I was living out in the Beaverton Aloha area. There was a 200 acre wildlife preserve that uh, the county was going to rezone for light industrial. A number of uh, families got together, said, gee, this is not a good idea. We were able to get the Twalen Hills Parks and Recreation District to come up with about five million bucks. That money was used to buy that 200 acres from the Archdiocese of Oregon. And what you have today is the Twalen Hills Parks and Recreation district nature park mm -hmm. one of the greatest users of that park are the local school districts wow. who load Makes up sense. their kids and their mm -hmm. plastic boxes and they come yeah, into the park sense. and they do nature studies mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. to give these kids some mm -hmm. real hands-on mm -hmm. experience with their telescopes and their microscopes and mm -hmm. their uh, looking glasses and their chemicals and so forth to check out how nature really works. Well, you know, you make a good point because one of the biggest problems we're having here in the city of Portland mm -hmm. is young people having nothing to do, right. nowhere to go, yep. Uh, yep. no career paths, and, and, yeah, and now the only thing we have now for them are basically a criminal justice system, <laughs> gang members, and all what this other loss. good stuff. It's really a sad situation. We don't have anything for some of these kids. Mm -hmm. This would be an ideal situation. Totally. So you, then you ask the question, where is the city council on this piece? Yeah. Where is the mayor? As well, we're anything, afraid that the mayor. Well, we're hoping. We're hoping. We keep pressuring all the time. We. Uh, I feel there's been a, a change in the tone of this project. You know, the this analysis they're going through right now, and um, the mayor was pretty gung ho. I don't know if he's just that gung ho anymore. Maybe you know, on a limit, more limited basis. I don't know. But we we're pushing them. We're trying to. We've been been picketing we've got signs out with these meetings on the West Hayden Island we've been we've got signs I was going to bring some I forgot to but uh, I think there's a tone the, the tone is changing the port wants this thing voted on before they get a council change for well, the business yeah side. yeah they want this to go through now because that's why they're pushing so hard you know I still think about the person that I used to know at one point in time very neat guy in fact when I was having some of my issues and when I was recruiting for the Marine Corps General name was a name. It was Congressman Wendell Wyatt. Remember him? Yes, yeah. sure. Very positive guy. Yeah, sure. Very environmentalist. 
and now it's all of a sudden his son now is the director mm -hmm. of the Port of Portland. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm making a statement to my dear friend <laughs> that, uh, you know, I remember Dad, and, uh, you know, I think you need to come on and get on board of this piece and, in fact, raise some of the money. I think we can put something together. You know what I'm saying? No, but that, that's well, a good maybe, point. Yeah, maybe. Right? maybe Bob, he, another job. He should come on. He should come on and explain why is uh, you feel that this would be a better place to build industrial rather than wildlife and make it a wildlife habitat and maintain a wildlife habitat and develop it so that the people within the, the tri, uh, not only the tri county area on the west on the on the uh, south side of the river but also on the north side of the river mm -hmm. that those people can have some place to go with their kids and explore some of the things that go well, on. Well, you know, often, you know, there's so much politics in business, right? Yeah. I mean, the big push about the money aspect of it. But like I said, I, and knowing why, you know, as I know him, I know that his family, I know his wife has been very much involved in kids and education, things mm -hmm. of that nature. That might be something that hopefully we might be able to pressure him into, hey, may, may I need to put this on this table, may, to get this a second look. Well, uh, these are business people, and they yes. should be looking at how this does and doesn't work from a business perspective. Yeah, right, 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 right. Every expert that's looked at this has said this is not likely to work. Mm -hmm. It is not a good business mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. It will destroy more than it ever creates. Mm -hmm. Here's the kicker. The Port of Portland is required anytime that they make a change in this property and they've downgraded it to some extent, they're required then to mitigate it. They're required to improve right. some other area right. significantly right. to the mm -hmm. same right. extent. They can't find any locations mm -hmm. to mitigate mm -hmm. adequately. So they're going to destroy something. They're going to have to improve something someplace else. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost them twice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they were to say, look, we're business people and we're also community minded, we recognize that there may not be a great demand for this facility. Let us develop this into a regional park that will generate income, that will keep the environment clean, that will promote tourism, that will cut down on pollution that will make our community healthier and it will generate more money for the entire region. With less output exactly. of funds. Exactly. Well, you know, you know, you would think this is just common sense. You know, just, <laughs> I mean, it just don't hey, make sense. Less common, common all the time. Sense. It's common, common yeah. sense. So now, you know, and Bob and I have been, I'm out of the politics of it is now. So yeah. I'm very low key on this piece, but this is a very serious piece. We got issues within these communities that we need to make sure we communicate with our kids. You know, sure. we've got, we, we got the school district getting ready to put mi millions of dollars, if you will, sure. building new schools. <laughs> and then I asked the question, what are you going to teach them? You know, how are you going to motivate them, if you will, to go to classes and whatever? Okay. Well, here's something here that could, I mean, ma imagine the excitement when a kid goes to the yeah. zoo looking at the animals. We get, Maybe we can get uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, the governor's new uh, chief. I got about oh. nine. Oh, yes. Well, anyway, yeah. we're, we're, education we're, education. Yeah. Those pictures yeah. we're, we're, we're running out of time, folks. I'm just going to put this picture up here. Which one is this? Right oh, that one there is a good How one. Good. Oh, that's well, a beauty. We're that's running beauty. out of time. Thank you very much for being with us, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you we very much, it. Bruce. We're going to be back. Thank yeah. you. We're gonna, yeah. Bob's going to get this again. Bob's going to get in touch with Wyatt, and we're going to have good. him on the show, and uh, he's going to talk with us. Sell tickets. That's right. You know me. I'll call anybody. I'll call the devil if I have to. Folks, thank you very much. See you next week. See you next week. Have a good one. Back to what you believe in, sort of George Page, what he said. And tune in to the debate, the debate between Charlie Hale and Jefferson Smith. Next week, take care. Cool.